Electric Power Bio Course, Achieving and Maintaining Competitiveness. I am Rafael Hertzberg. I am a top three influencer at Energy Central. And in 2023, I was awarded with the top community voice also by Energy Central. And uh, I am very glad to tell that also in 2023, I was awarded with the Global Sustainability Award. The agenda of this course will include power metrics, energy management systems, contracted, recorded, and bill demand, when locking a power deal, consumption control, demand control, demand response, cost arbitrage, power factor, and objectives and bonus. Before we start, let me address a few and very important issues. Whenever we look for achieving better energy-related results, we are talking about technical, financial, legal, and management issues. And I would like to quote Oscar Wilde, a very important author, writer. I am a simple man. I am always satisfied with the best. And I would like also to quote a very interesting psychologist, Dan Ariely. And he wrote a very interesting book by the name of Predictably Irrational. And I would say that achieving and sustaining better energy resu results demand changes. Changes generate conflicts. And the magic of conflicts, this is the path towards improvement. Power metrics. There are at least three very important ones. What, the first one is dollars per kilowatt hour. It is the total power bill divided by the amount of power consumption. The second one is kilowatt hour per activity. So it's the total kilowatt hour consumption divided by a physical value. It might be, for example, if it's a industrial plant, tons of products. If it's a commercial building, it's a number of people that work in that specific building or whatever suits you best. And the third one is dollars per activity, which is basically the result of the previous two metrics. Now we have to understand the power bill. There are, there are at least two basic components, kilowatt demand and kilowatt hour consumption. Usually the, these two components are charged by the time of use, peak and off peak. Kilowatt related charges are regulated and they are called as well as wire fees. Kilowatt hour charges may be regulated or deregulated. The first very good and strong advice, always keep track of the metrics. They tell if you are progressing or not. They become the reference for the whole team. They align perceptions and motivations. And here comes a very interesting point that I discovered throughout my career. There are two basically different postures, involvement and commitment. And consultants, they like to compare what happens with your breakfast, eggs and bacon. The, the chicken was involved with your breakfast, but the pork was really committed. Metrics are the basis for well-informed decisions. They define solid information. They allow analysis about what's happening and allow potential alternatives to be compared and considered. The metrics I just mentioned can be used as a whole and also as per process. As a whole, the companies overall metrics and per process, per each selected power consumption. The ABC curve 
applies and very well when you are discussing energy related improvements. And why? According to my experience, there are just a few very important electric loads that should be considered because they represent the bulk of the value of whatever is being activated at any given moment. The other B and C categories might be addressed as well, but they are not so important. So one of my first recommendations is basically discovering which are the A loads. And here are four pictures of the most important loads that you typically see in an industrial plant. Motors, furnaces, air compressors, and heat treatments. In commercial buildings, the most important loads are heating and cooling uh, loads, as well as lighting. We might look, for example, specific energy conversion processes. In this case, we are talking about an electric motor that it is activated by a variable frequency drive, a real case involving a plastic grinder. The original situation was the electric motor that was activating directly the grinder. And there was a specific consumption in terms of kilowatt hour per ton processed. Then I came up with the idea of using a variable frequency drive to uh, control the electric motor. And so there would be a new kilowatt hour per ton using this VFD. And the savings would be the current kilowatt hour per ton minus the new kilowatt hour per ton. What kind of internal rate of return do these savings offer? So I decided to propose to the client that we would basically set up an experience and measure what happens with the grinder with and without the variable frequency drive. So the first step was stimulating the variable frequency drive provider to test his product under real conditions. And then we would discover what kind of savings the variable frequency drive would reach. And then if, if it offered a very attractive internal rate of return, the client would go for it. And what actually happened was very interesting. Savings in terms of kilowatt hour per ton was 17%. And the payback for the variable frequency drive with respect to the power savings was less than one year. So the company decided to go for it for three variable frequency drives, simple, easy, and quick. And how did that happen? Well, I told the, the provider to set up an energy meter and I told the client to measure all the tons that were uh, sent to this grinder so that after a week we were able to compare the amount of energy used by the grinder with and without the variable frequency drive related to the tons of plastic processed in the grinder. The next tool is having a good energy management system. And why is that? Because it makes a lot of sense to have whatever you need on real time throughout all the days. And so 
Here is a sample of a screen of an energy management system where you can see what's going on on a daily basis. There, there are the blue columns, which are off-peak in this case, and the peaking hours are in orange. And the red line includes what was the average, the recent average for the demand profile. And the green dotted line represents the contracted demand, and the solid green line represents the maximum demand without penalties. So anyone, even if you are not an engineer, you can see right away what's happening with your daily curve without any problem. So in this case, the client was facing a very reliable demand curve uh, below the maximum contracted demand. And it was business as usual for this 24 by 7 operation. And the, the, the blue line below, which is called reactive power, shows you what happens with your KVAR uh, energy on an hourly basis. Energy management systems that operate on a real-time basis are excellent tools to uh, go for the demand profile, the power factor, the power consumption on peak and off peak, reactive power, simulation of the monthly power bill, and power factor correction. Energy management systems are great tools to warn you about very important facts. And I will tell you about three ones that are very important. When recorded demand is above the contracted demand, then you might pay very important penalties to the local electric utility company. So if the energy management system tells you in advance, you are able to quickly fix the situation. Or the second warning is about the power factor. Usually the regulator establishes a, maximum, a minimum power factor for each local electric utility company. So if you are below that minimum, you are paying, you will be paying penalties. And so you must take action quickly to avoid big penalties. And the third aspect, if, if you are a deregulated energy user, you always have to keep track of what's happening with your recorded volume of energy consumption. Because if you are consuming above the contracted value, you must quickly buy the difference to make sure that you are not, as we say, exposed in the market and subject to very heavy penalties. Or the reverse situation, you are recording a volume that is below the contracted one. So you have to sell this difference at the spot market and make the money out of it. Then there is another very interesting possibility. It's transferring as much as possible your energy consumption to off-peak hours. Differences money-wise are very important. Demand and energy rates on peak are way higher than off peak. This is a rate schedule that was uh, set by the regulator to one of the most important electric utility companies in the Midwest, in the US. The important aspect of these two tables is first, you can see that winter rates and summer rates are completely different. Summer is way more expensive than winter in terms of demand charges and energy charges as well. And you can see on the bottom uh, table that on peak hours and off peak hours, they do have very different 
rates. This is the monthly winter bill for this industrial plant in the Midwest. They, this um, plant cons consumed about 5,000 kilowatts in terms of demand. And the demand rate is roughly $11 per kilowatt, so that the monthly value of kilowatt demand is $55,000. The kilowatt hour energy, including peak and off peak, and considering the total energy consumption of 3 million kilowatt hours at um, 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour becomes $45,000 for energy. So the total invoice was $100,000. And one good metric I like to use, it's referred this $100,000 to the 3 million kilowatt hour. So the actual value for the energy used by this plant is 3.3 cents per kilowatt hour. So one has to pay very close attention that most of us, they look at what happens with the energy rate, which in this case is 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. But you have to consider the total package. And it means in this case, 3.3 cents per kilowatt hour. Takeaways regarding power metrics and energy management systems. It is easy to identify if your company or institution is achieving and maintaining competitive results. Energy management systems offer the most important power metrics analytically and graphically, which helps in a lot going for well-informed decision-making processes. Now let's discuss contracted, recorded, and billed demand. As we saw in the previous slides, the demand charge is very important in the monthly bill. Now, electric utilities may charge the contracted demand on a fixed mode. Let's say that this client had signed an agreement for a specific kilowatt value, or it may be a ratchet. The two systems are very popular around the globe and in the US as well. The ratchet is very a very simple arrangement by which the monthly contracted value depends on a percentage of the maximum recorded demand during a pre-established period of months, usually a year. It is as if each month, the contracted value is changed according to the ratchet result. The recorded demand is very important as well. Typically, kilowatt demand is measured each 15 minutes. So uh, it's the consumption of this window of 15 minutes divided by this these 15 minutes. It might be measured in 30 minutes or even in one hour intervals. It depends specifically on each local utility company. The maximum measured kilowatt demand according to this criteria is the recorded one. There are two basically recorded demands, on peak and off peak. But generally speaking, in a month, there are 30 days by 24 hours by four intervals per hour, if it's a 15 minutes window. So we are talking about 3000 windows of 15 minutes. The build demand, is the maximum between the recorded demand and the contracted demand. Where is the catch? The real life situation is a very challenging one. And why is that? The existing total kilowatt loads 
in any given plant or commercial building is about two times the ones used each interval. So easily the recorded demand can reach way higher values because at any given time, a larger fraction of the existing loads can be activated. The message here is the way to avoid, avoid higher demand is basically by controlling physically the real-time demand. The recorded demand in each interval it's a statistical phenomena according to my own experience. That means if you take your demand profile and then segregate by um, intervals, you get basically this Gauss distribution. The maximum demand is basically three standard devi deviations from the average. What does this Gauss graph tell you? Again, the maximum demand is usually three standard deviation, deviation apart from the average. The probability of recording a demand, for example, between two and three standard deviation is about 2%. If there are 96 15 minute intervals per day, it means that there are two intervals per day that could exceed two standard deviations. The strategy, as I would propose, is then controlling the recorded demand so as not to ex exceed two standard deviations. And why is that? Because it's a fairly small, so to speak, effort, because you are talking about basically two intervals per day, so it's not a very big deal. What are the potential savings if you control the demand by reducing one standard deviation? So the maximum current demand is the average demand plus three standard deviations. The, the maximum demand establishes the monthly recorded demand. So, if we consider that the average demand is the power consumption of that given month divided by the hours of the month, this is the standard deviation, maximum demand minus the average demand divided by three. And what are the savings if you are able to control the demand at two standard deviation is one standard deviation times the demand rate charged by the local utility company. Let's consider this example. Currently, the monthly recorded demand is 2000 kilowatts. The monthly power consumption of this industrial plant is 1 million kilowatt hours. The average power consumption is therefore 1 million kilowatt hours divided by 720 hours per month, which means 1400 kilowatts. So one standard deviation is 2000 kilowatts minus 1400 divided by 3. It means 200 kilowatts. The proposed demand control at 2000 kilowatts minus 200 kilowatts is 1800 kilowatts. Savings would be 200 kilowatts in terms of the monthly bill. Demand is charged in this example at $11 per kilowatt. So savings per month would be $2,200, which means $26,000 per year. The next important question is when locking a power deal, if you are a deregulated energy user, it's pretty much like what happens with the stock markets. You want to buy when the price is low and you want to sell if you have excess energy when prices are high. 
it's basically this concept. There is a very robust tool. I'm talking about the financial markets and it's very well known. You buy a stock when the ongoing prices are below the moving average and the relative strength index is below 30% typically. And you sell this stock when the ongoing prices are above the moving average and the relative strength index is above 70%. A very interesting metric I use is the marginal cost of expansion. It has been derived from this these other metrics I just mentioned before. It's the marginal cost of expansion associated with new plants to be built for generation of electric power. And capital expenditure is the single most important cost and by far for these uh, new power plants. And this is true for renewable power plants as well as for thermal power plants. And the renewable is only but the capital expenditure. The thermal power plants is capital expenditures plus fuel. Let's consider the marginal cost of expansion for a hydropower plant to be built. The investment, I would say, typically in the neighborhood of $1,000 per kilowatt installed. The horizon that investors look for is basically 20 years. And I would say that hydropower plants, they have a life of maybe 30 or 40 years, but the horizon the investor, investors look for is basically around 20 years. The interest rate, of course, depends uh, on the investor, but typically it's 15% per year at a minimum. And so if you um, consider the present value of $1,000, horizon of 20 years, and interest of 15%, you get an amortization cost of $13 per month per kilowatt. Now, if you consider that typically a hydropower plant produces about 400 kilowatt hour per month per kilowatt, then the amortization cost associated with this investment would be in the range of $32 per megawatt hour. Of course, the marginal cost of expansion is only but a reference. But let me elaborate a little more. When power prices for future delivery are below the marginal cost of expansion, then I see it as a window of opportunity for buyers. So the idea is keeping track of power prices for future delivery well in advance. And long-term outlook favors better deals. Short-term may be very volatile, but the idea is locking new deals when prices for future delivery are attractive. This is a real case situation. This industrial plant used to lock new contracts for a year. Their tradition was to go for it in November for the coming year. Then, of course, they had to stick to the market's offers. Of course, they had not control on the market prices. When I was contracted in March, I changed their procedures. I told the CEO back then, we will lock a new deal when prices are attractive. It may be well before November. Their ongoing contract price was in the neighborhood of $50 per megawatt hour. I showed the purchasing manager how to keep track of power prices for future delivery on a weekly basis. In August of that year, Prices for future delivery dipped to $26 per megawatt hour. I told then the purchasing manager and the CEO to waste no time and lock a deal right away. One more caveat. This company used to lock only for one year. I told them to close.
close a deal for three or five years given the super opportunity. I was then invited by the CEO to present my case to the board, given the fact that this suggestion was not consistent with their internal ongoing rules. I proceeded with my presentation and it was approved. Results. Power bill, which was a top three cost, dropped dramatically. Meanwhile, the spot market power skyrocketed to $160 per megawatt hour. I suggested to the CEO to stop operation in that location and sell the energy at the spot prices. Accordingly, get the, fin the finished products from other plants of the same group to keep deliveries as per the ongoing contracts. The results were fantastic. The plant was an automated operation with not many workers. But these workers were sent on vacation and then to training courses. The two megawatt contract was sold then at the spot. This sale represented, roughly speaking, 1.1 million reais per month. The cost paid to the contracted power trader was 0.18 million reais per month. The result of this operation was 11 million reais per year or 2.4 million dollars per year. Now let's talk about power pricing formats. The market is very used to fixed prices. You lock a deal for months or even years for a pre-established fixed price. The other possibility is you go and buy the, your power needs on the spot market, but then you might see a lot of volatility and that's not what um, clients want. But there is a third very interesting option, which is called the caller arrangement, by which you negotiate a floor price, a ceiling price, and between the spot and between the floor and the ceiling, the spot prices will govern this operation, and that's it. This is a real case situation involving a multinational pharma company. The spot then was very low. And they were very attracted to the spot, but of course, they didn't want to be subject to such high volatility, which is the trademark of the spot market. So what we ended up doing is shown in this graph. On the first year, 70% of the required volume was locked with a fixed price that was around $40 per megawatt hour. And 30% of their volume needs was locked in a color arrangement. So back then we negotiated a floor and a ceiling and between these two parameters, it was the spot market plus 10%. And for the second year, uh, it was very difficult to negotiate the caller arrangement with power traders. So we basically um, set up a fixed arrangement for the second and for the third year. The caller performed super well in that first year. It, it varied from 10 to $30 per megawatt hour and the floor was negotiated at $20 per megawatt hour and the ceiling $50 per megawatt hour. These are the takeaways. The market is in charge of making power prices. As always, it is a balance between supply and demand. The client does not control power prices. The client can, however, decide when to close a deal. In a longer term perspective, there are always opportunities. 
it depends on the client's proactivity. Now let's talk a little bit about consumption control, basically to reduce waste. What is the value of a megawatt hour saved? How to do it? It's very easy and proven. Programming the load use using a timer or an energy management system. And of course, avoid waste. This picture shows one programmable timer that is sold at $30 a piece. So it's very, very competitive. This is a real life situation. The first example, a one megawatt furnace that was melting aluminum. The tradition was to switch on the furnace at 5 a.m. and off at 5 p.m. because it was a one shift operation. The furnace would be ready after one hour at 6 a.m. But the new approach was switching on at 6 a.m. for the 7 a.m. shift. Megawatt savings was one hour times one megawatt per day or 22 megawatt hours per month. In terms of dollars, we are talking about 22 megawatt hours times $150 per megawatt hour which represented $3,000 per month or $40,000 per year. Why did these savings happen? The tradition, the team in, in charge of the plant security was used to switch on the furnace well before the shift started. The new approach, a timer was installed to control the furnace contactor, switching it on at 6 a.m. and the furnace operator was instructed to switch it off when the shift was ending. Very simple. Here goes a very interesting real life second example. A two megawatt industrial heating treatment for an auto part industry. It started full operations at 5 a.m. and ended at 8 p.m. Therefore, it invaded the on-peak hours, which for that specific plant was 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. The new approach, operate this heating treatment station till 5 p.m., then wait till 8 p.m. and run it again till 11 p.m. Great savings were achieved, and I will show you why. From 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., the rate was $50 per megawatt hour. And before this whole idea, it was 18 megawatt hours per day from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. From 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., it was peaking hours, $100 per megawatt hour and it was 4.5 megawatt hours during that time frame. And then from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., it was $50 per megawatt hour, but before, before any changes, uh, there was no energy consumption on that time frame. And after this idea was implanted of using only basically during off-peak hours. From 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., it was the same energy consumption of 18 megawatt hours, but from, eight, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., it was only used 1.5 megawatt hours because this uh, was um, switched to a standby mode. And uh, from 8 p.m. to 5 p.m., it was 4.5 megawatt hours. So the total energy consumption slightly increased. But here is what happened with power prices. Before, there was the 
last column nine hundred dollars from 5 a.m to 5 p.m then from 5 p.m to 8 p.m 450 dollars and the total amount of money paid per day was one thousand and three hundred and fifty dollars on a monthly basis it was thirty thousand dollars after the proposed changes in the power consumption profile the same calculation was made and the power cost per month dropped to twenty eight thousand dollars so it was a $24,000 per year savings by just shifting a little bit the time of use. Now let's talk about demand control, another very interesting opportunity. When we transform the, the graph that, that was shown in the previous slide, we get this kilowatt demand distribution by which the average demand is three standard deviations from the maximum demand. What is then the required action? Set up a demand control at the maximum demand minus one standard deviation. And the standard deviation is the maximum demand minus the average demand, all this divided by three. And the average demand is the power consumption in kilowatt hours of that given day divided by the number of hours. How to control the demand at maximum current demand minus one standard deviation? The first challenge is listing controllable loads. And by that, I mean finding high inertia loads and by that I mean a few minutes reduction won't matter. And this is typically about furnaces, heat treatments, heating and cooling, etc. When ongoing demand tends to exceed this new demand level, the controllable loads will be, so to speak, called. When the demand is phased as safely below the new control level, then these loads will be fully restored. Each of these controllable loads will be connected to the energy management system, because this would be an automatic situation. So when the demand control operates, it will shed loads. And this is what happens when you have a controlled demand. Another way to look at the same challenge is perhaps rearranging power consumption. And here you have the blue line, which represents what originally was happening in that specific facility. And the orange line represents what has been made after um, a rearrangement. So the peak was clipped and uh, the total demand was below that maximum value that was originally recorded. This is a real case example. Originally, the recorded demand was 5,000 kilowatts. The average demand was 3,500 kilowatts. So one standard deviation was roughly 500 kilowatts. The demand rate was $11 per kilowatt per month. So savings by reducing one standard deviation was $11 per kilowatt times 500 kilowatts or $5,000 per month. It means $66,000 per year. Another very interesting idea is enrolling in a demand response program. As we can see here, the blue line represents the typical demand profile of that given plant. So the idea here is uh, reducing 
the load when the utility company calls for a reduction. Why should one participate in a demand response program? Well, it is a voluntary reduction or shift of electricity used by customers, which can help to keep a power grid stable by balancing its supply and demand of electricity. The compensation is usually, usually a super hefty financial payment, many times the ongoing cost. Given this compensation, some electricity intensive plants, aluminum smelting operations, for example, may even stop their operation during these calls. What are the differences between a demand response program and a demand control? The demand response, your company will be called to reduce its load. It's voluntary to go for it. Typically, the demand response is called only by a few times a year. There is a very hefty compensation. The demand control, it's another animal, so to speak. You take the initiative to always control your recorded demand. Your company sets up a procedure, typically using an energy management system. The compensation is the reduction of the kilowatt billings by the local utility at the ongoing rate. The next possibility is cost arbitrage. It is a, a very important potential option when we are talking about electric power and other energy sources such as natural gas, for example. Each energy source has its own supply and demand and prices dynamic. So taking advantage of their differences, it's a huge possibility. Let me tell a very interesting story about this Canadian air training company that has worldwide offices and they provide pilot training, technical training and simulation products. And what I will tell was awarded by the PowerGen in the US. This was the arrangement that I proposed to this Canadian company uh, and this was their operations in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So we installed diesel gen sets that were connected to step up transformers and then to an automatic transfer switch. And this uh, arrangement was operating in parallel with the local utilities supply. And of course, given that these gensets would operate on a daily basis. You can see in the photo the diesel storage tank that was made available. So the whole idea can be shown here from a financial perspective. The on-peak generation added value to the whole package. And I will show you why. The on-peak utility rate was was $240 per megawatt hour. The diesel genset variable cost was $140 per megawatt hour. So savings were $100 per megawatt hour. The on-peak energy required per year was 800 megawatt hours. So savings per year would be $80,000. And here's the deal. With those savings, of $80,000 per year, we came up with a build, operate, and own and transfer arrangement with Petrobras, which was the investor and the diesel supplier. And Stemac was the turnkey packager for the genset and also the maintenance provider. So th this contract was paid basically with the on-peak savings. Therefore, this Canadian company was able to get um, emergency power for free, basically. This is a very interesting example of what can be done in a real case situation. When I was invited to consult for this 
pulp and paper company, as I saw that they, they were using biomass to produce low, low pressure steam that was required in their operations. And then I suggested that we uh, check one very interesting alternative, which would be cogeneration. And by that I meant developing a high pressure steam boiler, replacing the low one, and including a high pressure steam turbine to produce electric power. So the bottom line would be with the basically with the same amount of biomass, this company would then be able to produce a substantial amount of electric power and this would generate huge savings. Another possibility for this pulp and paper company was using a natural gas cogeneration co package by which there would be a natural gas driven turbine and the exhaust heat of this turbine would be used to produce steam. So it's a different technical arrangement, but the same concept. The difference between the previous slide and this one is basically the energy source. The, the other slide was about using eucalyptus, wood. And this one, natural gas, which was basically available uh, for this company. So the idea was checking the differences in, in price and conditions, and especially the risk assessment, because having wood available all the time is one very important issue for this pulp and paper plant. And on the other hand, having natural gas available is a great idea, but of course, it's, it was more expensive than wood. But then I was told that the wood supply was not really so um, easy to consider because uh, it depended on fairly small farms. And this was a, a risk in the eyes of this pulp and paper uh, management. And um, the natural gas, on the other hand, was a very reliable possibility, slightly more expensive, but then this was the question to be dealt with. Another very interesting case is about a high voltage access. And why did I suggest this high voltage access? because there was a very important challenge on the table. This industrial plant was connected originally at 13 kV. But the matter of the fact was that they had about 60 hours per year of unplanned power interruptions and huge losses derived from each restart, which took basically around eight hours. So lots of loss revenues because it was a 24 by 7 operation. By building the 138 kV axis, unplanned power inter interruptions would drop to six hours per year, but it would require a one mile 138 kV transmission line connecting the local utility at this voltage level to the client. And of course, a step down substation would be needed also. This high voltage access would need a $2 million investment, but the client did not want to go for it for basically two reasons. First, they thought it, it's a very complex project, of course, from their perspective. And secondly, it's, it's not in their core business. So why should they care about it? So I told them that one possibility would be developing a BOOT arrangement by which the contractor that would be hired 
was going to build, operate, and own F. And after seven years, they would transfer the project to the client. And it was negotiated with the contractor that he would get 90% of the, 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 of the savings, which derived from lower kilowatt demand charged, charges at a higher voltage level. Now let's talk about power factor correction. It is basically to avoid penalties. And that is very easy by adding capacitors. The minimum power factor usually is about 92%. Some for some utilities, it's about 85%. For others, higher than that. Or the demand may be charged by KVA and not by kilowatts. So it depends on each specific electric utility company. The calculation to avoid penalties originated by poor power factor is shown in this uh, slide here. It's really very, very simple. You have the real power, which is the green line, and then you have the uncorrected power factor, and then you have the corrected power factor, and the difference means that you have to add QC capacitors to make sure that this correction is made. So uh, it's basically a very simple calculation, and all the information you need is offered in the electric utility bill presented by your local utility company. The internal rate of return is usually less than a year for investments made in capacitors. Uh, and basically, it doesn't make any sense to pay for low power factor penalties. And now let's talk about how to stimulate the team to, to go for the much needed energy related results. I'm talking about objectives and bonus. It's basically to align the team's perceptions and motivations. It should be a structured process. And by that, I mean, first, getting high quality information about energy uses and costs. We talked about that when we presented the metrics. And then you analyze what's going on with your metrics. You understand what kind of alternatives might be there to be considered. And most importantly, by the end of this process, you go for well-informed decisions. When I talk about information, I mean first select energy metrics that will be used. Secondly, discover boundary conditions. This is extremely important because in each specific case, you will find different conditions that should be met. For example, time frame. Some companies are very strict and they just want product, projects that would uh, offer a very hefty payback in a very short amount of time. Others will tell you that if they get a, a decent internal rate of return for uh, a longer horizon, it's OK. But you have to understand at first what's on the table. And then you have to understand from the beginning if this company is willing to buy assets or if they would rather contract energy as a service in a structured process. And then, of course, you will have to understand who will lead the energy-related solutions. And then, of course, we have to understand very well what kind of perceived risks are at stake and what kind of mitigation tools might be there to handle these risks. And then uh, develop a strategic plan and an operation plan. This is what I call information. When you have all the information available, the next step is analysis. What kind of energy-related solutions should be considered? What kind of advantages, disadvantages, and associated risks are at stake? 
the alternatives that should be considered for each potential energy related solution involves timeline activities and sh who should be in charge contractual proposed format for, for example uh, bot shared savings engineering procurement and construction etc in-house capital expenditures or not identifying benefits and when they will happen. Then comes decision making. You have to prepare a high level document showing the proposed alternatives. And basically you have to prepare a presentation to be understood by all decision makers. And once these alternatives made sense for the decision makers, the next step, it's time to send a request for proposal. Then comes decision making. Once proposals were received, rank them. Present to the decision makers the ranking. Discuss which should be negotiated towards closing deals. Now it would be time to establish for each energy leader team a plan. The plan is basically a document showing objectives and bonus associated with these objectives. And this, in my experience, strongly motivates leaders to go for it. It's a win-win situation and by far. Let me tell you about a real life situation. Uh, back then for this uh, electric connectors and accessories operation, the engineering and production teams were always in conflict energy waste and peak clipping were not flying. Engineering was always telling me that the production people, they didn't care. The production people told me that the engineering don't have a clue about the reality on the production floor. So after a long time being the CEO of this operation, I decided to establish objective and bonus for the two leaders and very soon the objectives were accomplished because it made sense for both of them and this is a real life situation um, regarding a very large automotive part industry the, currently the furnace was running with lng an electric induction furnace was available and years ago this furnace was used when the government decided to offer very attractive power prices, well below the LNG. So, but when I was contracted by this company, I noticed that the plant was running well below its nominal capacity. A significant part of the electric power was so that the spot these guys were deregulated energy users and they were consuming way below the nominal volume that they have contracted from the power trader but it happened that the spot power prices were well below the prices that they locked with the power trader so the ongoing situation was an important loss because they paid uh, for the power trader uh, a price that was a lot higher than the price that they were getting by selling at the spot market. This was my proposition. Start using the electric induction furnace and not using the LNG furnace so far then there would be no need to, ex to sell excess power at a huge loss. So this table shows what happened. The ongoing situation, this company was paying uh, for the power an excess uh, at a loss. The excess energy that they didn't consume was sold at a loss. And then they had to pay for the LNG cost. So the total, total monthly cost was the LNG cost plus the loss. The proposed situation was not using the LNG furnace and only use 
the power. So the contracted man, uh, the contracted power was the only cost that they were going to bear. This multinational automotive company with several plants in Brazil needed to access power at a higher voltage in one of their plants. The contracted demand would jump from 6 megawatts to 10 megawatts. The local utility told them that they would have to go from 13 kV to 138, and there would be an important capital expenditure in, involved. Uh, step down substation. When I visited their plants in, uh, spread out in the country, uh, I noticed that one of their plants was actually connected at 138 kV. And there were two step down 138 kV to 13 kV transformer, but one was idle. So my proposition was very simple use this idle transformer for the other plant. And this would change dramatically the capital expenditure involved because the step-down transformer is the single most important cost for this step-down substation. Thank you very much for having watched this presentation and here goes my contact information.